This conference will now be recorded. All right, very good. So folks, uh, those of you online, as well as those of you in the classroom, you can see that I've shared with you, uh, it's gonna be in coursework. And this document, you'll see for those in, on, in class, the points, the rubric is a little bit different than those that are taking the course online. But you'll see that it's you're gonna everybody's gonna require to do pretty much the same thing as far as the format is concerned. We're gonna be using APA, right, format for this uh, paper, okay? It doesn't have to be a very long paper, but you're going to do what you can to, you'll see here, you will research a disease and report the findings by providing the following information for your chosen disease. And you'll see here as far as that, I've given you all here as far as what I would like present within the paper. An introduction, the etiology, the cause, the demographics, who actually uh, will will get this, uh, can get this illness and such. And make sure you take a couple of minutes. Happy Halloween. Yeah, absolutely. Signs and symptoms, right? Um, diagnostics, how we're determining whether a person has this illness. Uh, any type of treatment, any type of uh, prognosis would be, you know, what is what does it look like for someone who actually has this disease? Will they will they recover, or will this be a chronic illness, or will this possibly even be an acute illness that could kill them? Right? We don't know. So you'll you'll tell us. Uh, you'll see here the prevalence within uh, the United States, with the, throughout the world, uh, new treatments or research, and you'll see here also, right? You'll need uh, reliable, two reliable resources, okay? Other than your textbook, okay? Um, your textbook can be one. I, I really want two additional resources in addition to the textbook. So you need to know that. And I'll, I'll correct this here. So the textbook is not really one of them. I want two reliable resources plus you can use the textbook. You'll see here where it says there. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. That is cool, okay. That is that is uh, from Trick or Treat, I think. Yeah, that's. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right. That is that is very cool. I like that. Come on over here. I want to let's just show everybody. Let's stop sharing for a moment here. <laughs> I'll guide you. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you, you. Very cool. Very cool. From Ooh. trick or treat. <laughs> nice. You committed to that. That's she awesome. Really did. She did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, they said that's cool. They, they all appreciate it. <laughs> nice. One day. So you'll see here also, as far as in the uh, where it says discuss, right? Excuse me. So I not only want you all uh, to be able to write about a disease and such, but I also want you to be able to tell me a little bit of an experience from someone that you know that is actually experienced that is dealing with this illness. Okay. So discuss the life of a patient who is living with the illness. Challenges. Is it easy? How difficult is it? Um, YouTube has vlogs, right? Video vlogs that you can. Uh, watch and observe people discussing if you don't know of anybody offhand yes it can yeah so if it's you if you're the person who's suffering with the illness and such you can talk about what it's like to experience this illness okay so that's fine also all right yeah so absolutely so any questions you know please let me know all right but that's the rubric and what goes on yes so we'll take and the textbook so yeah so i'm making a correction I'm making an addendum to what you have here. So it's two reliable resources and your textbook can be a third one. Wait, yes, for, for the paper. Did you did you come over here and get this stuff? Oh, okay. yeah, so, all right, so this is going to be, uh, do, yeah, so I have to look at the dates, I'm sorry. So it's going to be the latter part, so in December, really, in December, that's when we're gonna start uh, doing the presentations and such. I don't think we're going to be doing it yet at the end of November. I think it's going to be beginning of November, but I'll beginning of December, but I'll let you know for sure. Sorry, I, didn't, I should have gotten that date here. All right, very good. So that's it as far as the paper is concerned. And now what we're looking at here, folks, is chapter nine. Chapter nine, dealing with the immune system, 
as well as the lymphatic system, which works in conjunction with the cardiovascular system with the blood in order to maintain an immune function for your body. Okay, so let's uh, let's begin. Let's begin. Let's go here. Shh. All right, so. Yep, come up and grab the papers here, please. We've got the PowerPoints here. So when we think about the body's immune function and the ability to actually have an immune function, right? We have to figure out, well, what's going on as far as the structures of the body, the anatomy of the body that can contribute to the protection of the body. And so you'll see here that three lines of defense, physical barriers, this innate immunity, and this adaptive immunity. And we just think about those terms for a moment, right? If something is innate, it's something pretty much that you already have, right? That's within that you already have. Adaptive, well, wow. So that could be something where there needs to be some type of adaptation taking place and adapting to and responding to the environment and such. And so we'll talk more about this. You'll see this term here that's brought up, antigen. Antigens are proteins. And these are proteins that are presenting on the outer portion of a cell. And, and know that when we have, look at here where it says foreign substance that triggers the body's immune response. So viruses, toxins, cancer cells, bacteria. I didn't write that on there, but know that bacteria. Absolutely. So viruses are even tinier than bacteria. Okay, so bacteria are small. Viruses are even tiny, and viruses actually can hijack our cells of the body as well as bacterial cells, but really, really small cells. So let's move on to then look at as far as these physical barriers. And when you think of the human body, you have to believe that the skin is going to be one of the major physical barriers to anything that can make us sick right? That could cause an infection, that could make us sick. So the skin. How about the linings of the body cavities and tubes? So think about the respiratory system, right? We're taking in air. How about the digestive system? We're taking in what? We're taking in nutrients and such, water. We're taking in liquids. We're taking in solids. So the linings of those cavities and tubes, right? So the, the, the organs of our body, they also act as a protective barrier, chemical barriers to infection. And so we're going to talk about uh, some of the chemicals and such that the body has uh, that can contribute to this protection and acting as a physical barrier. One of the major uh, like protective chemical barriers, how about think of mucus, right? Mucus, which is kind of gross. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's disgusting, right? But mucus <laughs> is important, though in order to protect the respiratory system as well as the digestive system, okay? So the innate immunity, the innate immunity. So here we go. So immunity, first, we have to just get the, the term down as far as the definition. So the body's overall ability to resist and combat something that is not itself. And we realize that within the human body, our immune system is able to determine whether cells are self, their own body cells, or they're foreign, right? That's a problem. Now, how about in the case of, say, an autoimmune disease? That's when the Does, body attacks itself. That's when the body attacks itself. So then the body has a problem with determining whether a cell is self or non-self, okay? And that's a big deal. And so that issues like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, multiple sclerosis, as well as other types of um, uh, endocrine disorders like hyperthyroidism, uh, hypothyroid. There are those that are also options that are autoimmune and can really uh, play havoc with the human body. So the innate immunity, preset responses to infection preset present from birth. And what can help contribute to this uh, immune response would be anything that mom is giving to the baby and such too that the baby is born with and will mature over time. So we, we get it that like the immune system for an infant and for a child, right? They're going to be much less, uh, have a much less ability to protect the child 
than say an adult who's been living for the past 30, 40, 50 years, right? That their immune system is, we would say, immature and it needs to develop and grow. Well, this innate immunity preset from birth, carried out by white blood cells and blood proteins. These proteins are very important. They're called complement and they are involved in really attacking um, different bacterium and, and different types of uh, uh, cells that could make you sick. Simple as that. Right? Now you'll see here that the responses are general. So we would say, we'll, we'll use this term, specific and nonspecific. That adaptive immunity that you saw before, that's going to be specific, right? Specific immune response. So in other words, like if you have been exposed to chicken pox, say, so when I was a kid, I was five years old, right? Last, last week of, of kindergarten, I ended up getting chicken pox from in the classroom and such. And this is going back 1970, okay? So many, many years ago, didn't have the vaccine and such, right? And so how did you get chicken pox? Because other people had chicken pox, you were exposed to it, you got chicken pox for the most part, right? And so how about now, if my body is exposed to that and my body is healthy and well, my body ha can have a response that is very specific to that bacterium and such, okay? And the virus, not the bacterium, virus, okay? Now, in the case of, say, if your immune response is weak and you're sick, then somebody who has chicken pox can end up having something that is uh, called herpes zoster. And what happens is that it's a case of where you'll end up getting shingles. Has anybody ever heard that term, shingles, right? Yeah, so that can be in predetermined areas of the body correlating with uh, the nerves of the spine and the spinal cord that can have a presentation of like a strap or an area, and it can also be on the face and such, um, where maybe one-sided or both sides where this uh, chicken pox shows out and it affects the nervous system and it's really quite painful. Yeah, so you don't want that, that's for sure. But that's, we're talking about the specific response. This non-specific, this innate immunity is non-specific. That you need to keep in, aware of and understand the differentiation between them. So what'll happen is that non-specific to the type of antigen that is presenting. So the different illnesses and such, well, yeah, there's going to be this non-specific response trying to take care of whatever it is that you're exposed to. But when it comes to then this adaptive immunity, this is the specific response. You've been exposed to the cold virus, a specific cold virus, right? A flu virus. And your body has the ability to fight that, okay? Because it's been exposed to it in the past. And so the response will be faster and quicker for your immune, immune response because you've already been exposed to it, okay? Specific response. It's triggered by that innate immunity. Now understand this, that your body works at multiple levels in order to protect you and help you to stay healthy and well. So while the immune, innate immune response is working, the adaptive immune response is also working. So they're working in conjunction. It's not like you have two separate immune systems. No, it's just one immune system with multiple, multiple levels of response. Now this adaptive immune response, look here, it says changes during a lifetime. And let me change the slide here. There we go. Yeah. So it changes during the lifetime and, it, and your immune response will mature. And that's a good thing as a result of exposure to uh, different types of pathogens. So responses are tailored to particular attackers, right? Like I said, so a huge numbers of white blood cells will counterattack the counteract the invasion of whatever it is that's making you sick or trying to or attempting to make you sick. So this is really important. So it takes about a week to develop this adaptive specific response. So it's slower acting than the innate immune response. The innate re immune response is quick, quick, but it's nonspecific. The, in, the adaptive, the specific immune response takes a little bit of time, but once you've been exposed to something, again, subsequent exposures, it'll be more, it'll be definitely faster and stronger response to keep you well, healthy and well. You'll see here, um, this adaptive immunity leaves behind the cells that continue to provide immunity for a long time. So these memory B 
and T lymphocytes, specific types of white blood cells, they're with you for years, folks, for years. Now, you ever notice that uh, you end up, uh, you scratch yourself outside, right? You get a cut. And what do, they, what do they ask you to do? They ask you to get a booster, right? Because they want you to get a booster in order to prevent you from getting sick. So, um, and I'm blanking on, I hate that. <laughs> uh, when, when you, tetanus, thank you. So you've already had a tetanus shot when you were younger, right? And they want to have you get those booster shots just to make sure that your immune system, your immune response is strong enough that it's going to fight what this, if, if possible, that you're being been exposed to it and prevent you from getting sick, right? And getting uh, tetanus because tetanus is uh, is life threatening, folks. Are we supposed to do that every time you get a cut outside? Um, you know depending upon how bad the cut and such and where in the location. So here's here's the, one of the key issues that you should know, that if you have a cut and you're uh, in, like at a farm where there's fecal material that's present, there's a higher risk of factor of getting uh, tetanus than, than not. Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. Yep. All right, so innate and adaptive. So here we go as far as just giving you a little bit of a chart that gives you an idea as far as what goes on with these two types of Immune responses, again, one is quicker, one is slower, but the one that's slower over time, right, it has this long-term immune response. The innate immunity is not very long, long response, okay? So just know the difference between them. I have a weird question. Yeah, go for it. Is it so I know, like, is it possible to train your immune system to, like, take to be better at fighting all things? Well, you know, you can you can strengthen it by making sure that um, when you are exposed to something, right, that you're taking like nutrients and even vitamins can help to boost. So that's a good response because like, so what do you think about like um, air shield? Have you ever seen that? Or these different types of things that you can take supplements that'll actually advertise that they can strengthen your immune response. Yeah, yeah. I've done it. I've taken it. And, you know, having these vitamins. Um, they can help to boost your immune response and strengthen your immune response um, short term. But again, when you're taking these vitamins that are water soluble, they go in, they go out, right? So they don't stay with you very long term. Hence the need to take them on a regular basis. Here we have as far as some different uh, cells that are responding to. And so in particular, primarily all of them are white blood cells except that dendritic cell. But you'll see here, neutrophil eosinophil, basophil, the macrophage, which was a monocyte at one time, which is a white blood cell, and the lymphocyte. Those are all white blood cells. That dendritic cell, that's one of the types of cells that's out there in that first response. And what it'll do, as well as that macrophage, it'll take a cell that could quite possibly make you sick and ingest it, phagocytize it, cell eating, you say, and break it down, bless you and then present it on its plasma membrane and then help to initiate that specific immune response. First the initial, the innate, and then the initial, the specific immune response. Very important. Now you've ever heard, and this is just showing you some white blood cells and what's going on as far as the immune response. This slide here, let me just show for those online. These white blood cells are very important. And we all have heard of HIV. We all have heard of AIDS, right? So what goes on with those helper T cells, those T cells, those T lymphocytes? I said to you before, you saw before, look at this before, right? The memory B and T lymphocytes, those B and T lymphocytes, there's more than just memory type of those white blood cells. And these specific cells called these helper T cells help to really um, start and initiate the immune response for specific immunity. That's very important. And that really, without those helper T cells that become infected by the HIV virus, they infect those cells and really prevent the specific immune response from taking place. And that's a problem. That's really a bad thing, okay? So that's what HIV does is. So HIV will hijack these helper T cells and prevent them from doing their job 
in really mounting a specific immune response. And this is why people then that have HIV can become, have issues where they can become, uh, their immune systems really are, are very weakened and do not respond to uh, protect the patient as they properly were, were made to do. So you'll see here as far as the neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, so parasites, eosinophils. So if a patient has, bless you, if a patient has a parasite infection, their body will produce more eosinophils to help fight that infection. Bacteria, primarily the neutrophils, okay? The basophils release inflammatory responses, substances, so they can, basophils during like allergic reactions and such, and uh, allergies, basophils. And really they're trying, then they're also, there's other chemical, I'm trying to give you like a very uh, basic, <laughs> representation of a very complex part of our body as far as the immune system is concerned. Uh, know that there are many chemicals also that are being released and that contribute to, so like histamine. What, what happens when you have an allergic reaction? You take an antihistamine, right? So histamines are, are naturally produced and they're part of the immune response, but if there's too much of those levels, that can really make you feel lousy and terrible. That's and like so we take an antihistamines. Have you ever heard of an Benadryl? You know what Benadryl is? It's antihistamine, right? So, yeah, so that can also contribute to, so, yes, absolutely. So the, the um, epinephrine, right, or adrenaline, that can help in the immune response as far as if you, right, it does keep, that's correct, because it stimulates that specific, not, not the specific, the um, sympathetic immune system. Shh, guys, shh. All right, so dendritic cells. Dendritic cells alert the immune system, like I said, so they will eat, quote unquote, phagocytize, they'll eat anything that's gonna make you sick, right? Any of these cells that have been infected or these cells that are coming into the body. And again, they're gonna alert your specific immune system. So those dendritic cells, very important. Um, the B and the C cells, as far as those lymphocytes are concerned, white blood cells also, they can recognize these specific antigens and initiate a specific immune response, that adaptive immunity. Now the lymphatic system works in conjunction with your cardiovascular system, in particular with the blood, in order to give you an immune response. So you'll see here that the lymphatic system picks up fluid loss from capillaries and returns it to the bloodstream. And What'll happen is that, look over here on our model, over here by the windows, by the windows. Excuse me, ladies. <laughs> you see right. You'll see here, let's take this off. Okay, so, so take a look right here. So right here and right here, these blood vessels, right, that they're blue, right? So they're carrying deoxygenated blood. So the lymphatic system, will bring this lymph fluid from all over the body and bring it into here so that it can go into the into the right side of the heart, that right atrium, right? That right upper chamber, that's taking deoxygenated blood and it's gonna bring it to the lungs for oxygenation. So look on the, the slide again. The lymphatic system has this fluid loss from capillaries. So tiny blood capillaries, these tiny blood vessels, will leak fluid. Do you remember the fluid portion of the, the blood is the plasma. So that fluid, part of it's gonna leak out into the body tissues. And then the lymphatic system, we're gonna look at these cells, these uh, tiny vessels in a moment, will suck it up, will take it up. And that'll become this lymph. So look here where it says lymph. Tissue fluid that is moved into lymph vessels. So this lymph, that fluid is as a result of, it's a blood product. It's the, it's the, the fluid portion of the blood. Take a look here at this next slide. And what you're seeing here is that those green vessels and those green structures and such, these are going to help to take up this fluid, this lymph. And then it's going to, as the lymph, is going throughout, see these, they're like green vessels, they're going throughout the body, they're coming up, 
they're going to come to the heart and enter back into that right atrium, that upper chamber of the heart. That's going to then take, it's going to take the blood plus the lymph, mix it together, send it to the lungs, ox oxygenate it, and then send it out to the tissues of the body via the left side of the heart. So what goes on is that these structures right here that you're looking at on this image, your immune system, and specifically those white blood cells and the different cells and structures present in your body that are part of the immune system will observe what that fluid is. If there's anything that's bad that can make you sick, it's going to then mount a response to it within that fluid. So the lymph system is very important. So why is it then, so you tell me, why is it that when someone has cancer, they might, they'll check these lymph nodes, those little green nodules there, they'll check them and they'll look for cancer cells and such. Why would they do that? What do you think? Well, what, how about this? Why is it that we would check it? Well, I mean, what's the, what's the deal? Why would we check it? If someone has, say, breast cancer, why would we check those lymph nodes close to it? That's right, because what happens is that, it, that the cancer cells will metastasize. They'll be in one area, creating a tumor, but then they start to travel to, the, to the other areas of the body. That's a bad thing, right? We all know that's a bad thing. You don't have to be a doctor to figure that one out. If cancer cells metastasize, if they move to another area, it's not going to be good. And then it's going to spread to other tissues, and that's very bad, right? So very important then that our lymphatic system, working in conjunction with the blood, with those blood cells, in order to monitor, look for anything that can make us sick, whether it's bacteria, whether it's a virus infected cells, or how about those cancer cells, and mount a response. You'll see here with this next slide, it's showing you a lymph node, right? So if we were to cut open a lymph node, what you'll see is that, folks, that there's more vessels that could be coming into the lymph node, bringing that fluid, and then fewer lymph node, lymph vessels exiting or, or taking the fluid away from the lymph node. Why would that be important? What do you think? If I have more vessels coming to and less vessels going away from, would that slow down the lymph fluid passing through that lymph node? It would. Okay. That's important. So it's very, it, what will happen is that we have a, a bunch of lymph coming in, right, that fluid. We're slowing it down and allowing it to stay within that lymph node by having only fewer vessels, lymphatic vessels, taking it away from the node. And so you'll look here in cross-section and see that there are multiple areas where those cells can be present in order to look and see, hey, are there any cancer cells? Are there any virus-infected cells? Right? Are there any bacterium? And then we can, as a result of those cells present in that lymph node, have you ever touched, palpated, like when you go to the doctor's office, right? and they, they touch your neck in particular, maybe under your armpits and such. They're, they're looking for swollen lymph nodes. Have you ever had that? They can be even painful and such. It's because that's your immune system trying to fight something, fight something that's trying to make you sick. Or maybe you really are sick and it's overwhelming your body and those lymph nodes are being overwhelmed. And that's okay, it's part of the process. Um, but that's why a swollen lymph node it's your body doing its job. That's a good thing. Let's look at the next slide here. And what you're seeing, folks, is that the lymph vascular system, so it's it's blood, it's vas vessels, just like uh, very similar to the, the uh, cardiovascular system, tiny vessels, larger vessels, but it functions in what? Drainage, delivery, and disposal. Have you ever seen it? Let me show you an image here. Let me show you an image. We're going to watch a short video in a couple minutes.
lymphatic filariasis. Yeah. No, I'm just going to show you a video. That would be better. Here we go. We'll wait for this to play. Folks online, I'll move the computer in just one moment as I just get it set. Okay. All right. Give me one moment. Just get the computer here. All right, folks. Just pay attention to this. This is quite interesting. Okay. Shush. Thank you. All right. All right. This one's not. I don't know why this isn't. All right. Let's let's find another one. For outsiders, it's a strange, horrific disease of the tropics, elephantiasis. But for those who live in communities like this in Nigeria, it's a common scourge we face every day. Grotesquely swollen feet, legs, and other body parts, broken skin with infected ulcers, a painful, disabling disease infecting 120 million people worldwide. Here, this woman is an example of the early stage of elephantiasis. The leg is, is very hard. It's very hard for me to press on it. And here, if you can see this, there are small bumps developing on her toes and, the, uh, uh, and on the foot. And this will continue to harden and the skin will continue to change so that it'll become like an elephant skin. And that's where the word elephantiasis has come from. The medical term for this disease is lymphatic filariasis, or LF, caused by small parasitic worms that cluster in the body's lymphatic system, blocking the flow of lymphatic fluid, causing it to drain downward into the legs. All right, so, so take a look at this image from this one right here. All right, so let's look at this one again. All right, so you, here you're seeing, this is showing you the different vessels, You've got the different little tiny vessels that carry the fluid and bring fluid back to the heart. Now, imagine that these, these vessels, these tiny little vessels throughout, imagine they get filled with and they're blocked with tiny little worms. Does that freak you out a little bit? That's a little bit Halloween scary, right? Seriously, that is some terrible stuff. And so what can happen is that this can really be devastating to the patient and such. And so it can really cause major changes within their life and affect their ability to even work. It's a terrible illness. Let me come back to the video. We'll finish watching it, just a few more minutes. But they're trying to do different things in order to help others in, throughout the world. Part of it, folks, is preventing people from getting bit by mosquitoes. 
This is how it's trained. Just like malaria, remember we, we looked at that as far as we looked malaria, well, this also, elephantiasis, also known as lymphatic filariasis, Swelling mosquitoes. The there is no cure for LF. No cure, no. You can mitigate this swelling by washing the part of the body that's affected to keep secondary bacterial infections from coming in and by elevating that part of the body to help the, the drainage of, of fluid that causes the, the, the swelling. But the best intervention for this is to prevent it. Prevent and so prevention is a big deal, but there is treatment that they can do as far as they can wrap the leg, right? Or both legs, depending upon if both are infected. And they can wrap it real tight and have the patient also have that part, that limb elevated so that we can help to like quote like squeeze the fluid back into the body and so they'll they'll produce more urine as well as their this is one way to get rid of that extra fluid and such yes weird question is it possible to just like put a hole and pop and like pop no that's or? not yeah so that's why the squeezing of the fluid squeezing of the 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 extremity can help to bring it back into the body and then to alleviate it by uh, urinating and such. Yep. Mm -hmm. Almost done. Is the first goal of the Carter Center's lymphatic So prevention is a big program. key here. Like the malaria parasite, the worms that cause LF are transmitted by mosquitoes, and that's the key to its prevention. It can be prevented by treating people by mouth with certain uh, tablets once a year and by uh, providing impregnated Redness, the same kind that uh, prevent the mosquitoes that uh, malaria for biting people, also prevent these mosquitoes from biting people uh, as well. In Nigeria, the Carter Center has assisted in distributing nearly 60,000 bed nets to village families. And what we're doing currently here is visiting um, each of the homes. And uh, when we arrive, we take the family and we also look at those who are qualified to get the drugs and those who are qualified to get the bed nets. They are actually teaching Tanao how to handle the net so as to enable it to uh, cover the bed completely and also get it tucked underneath so that uh, she has complete protection. And by treating millions of people with deworming drugs every year, drugs that kill the baby worms that mosquitoes would otherwise pick up and transmit to others, there is now real progress to show prevention of lymphatic filariasis is working. Infection rates have decreased by 80% in sampled villages. By combining treatment programs for LF and malaria, the Carter Center is assisting health authorities in Nigeria to maximize the impact of health outreach programs. And in these same villages, the center also joins the fight against other parasitic diseases, river blindness, and schistosomiasis. The primary weapons, bed nets, oral drugs, and health education, like this demonstration showing how to clean skin areas affected by LF to minimize secondary bacterial infection. The World Health Organization has set 2020 as the target date for global elimination of lymphatic filariasis. The pharmaceutical companies, GlaxoSmithKline and Merkin Company, have pledged to donate billions of deworming pills to achieve this goal. Funding is provided by institutional partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, GlaxoSmithKline, and the A.G. Leventis Foundation. But what is needed is support by private donors and continued field work by volunteers and professionals like these. In Nigeria, the world's third most endemic country for lymphatic filariasis, the Carter Center plays a leading role in fighting this agonizing disease. Okay. All right. We're going to watch another video at the end, but let's uh, go back to our slide presentation here. And so we're going to look at then the specific organs of the lymphatic system. Right.
All right, so before we mentioned lymph nodes, okay? So lymph nodes, again, they're filtering lymph. So they're filtering that fluid, looking for anything that could make you sick, quite possibly could make you sick. So that's the lymph nodes. They're throughout the body. They filter the lymph. There are white blood cells that are in the lymph node chambers that will look for anything that can make you sick, and that's a good thing, and then start an, an immune response. The spleen. So the spleen, folks, look over here on this model next to the window. So the spleen, left side of the body, right near the kidney on the left side of the body. There we go. All right. So here you can see the pancreas, and here's the spleen right there, okay? The spleen is right there on that left side. And the spleen will filter the blood and have the same type, very similar role as far as those lymph nodes, but it's going to be filtering blood, not the lymph. And again, looking for anything that could quite possibly make you sick, right? So very important. So it also will have these lymphocytes, these white blood cells that can then mount an immune response if we do find something that can make you sick. And the thymus gland, you're not seeing the thymus gland on there, but it's really, look over, look at this, uh, let's see. Here's the heart. Here's the heart. And in this area right here, in this area right here, this is where the thymus gland would be. As we get older, the thymus gland is not as needed. But when you're younger, the thymus gland is very important. And what will happen is that these T cells, these T lymphocytes, they'll multiply and become specialized. They'll mature in the thymus gland, hence the term T cells. Thymus gland, T cells, right? So very important for your immune response. This next slide is just showing you what goes on as far as, to the green? The green represent uh, bacteria, okay? Rod-shaped bacteria, okay? Those bacteria are going to interact with your immune system and specific types of cells, white blood cells, that are going to identify them, phagocytize, eat them, and then help to activate the specific immune response of your body. This next slide shows you as far as the importance of those blood cells that are produced by the red marrow at the ends of bone and such. That red marrow is very important, okay? And producing those blood cells. So if you have a It issues with stem cells, okay? So if we if we give you stem cells, right, that are going to be from bone marrow, so a bone marrow transplantation, bone marrow transplant, we're putting them into the marrow in order to reboot a person who's very sick, their immune system that's not functioning like it properly should. So how about people that have leukemia? Can this be a, a, a way of treatment and such? Absolutely. And so actually receiving um, marrow from a healthy donor and then implanting it right into someone who could who is very sick this can help them as far as fighting um, leukemia as one specific illness and you're seeing here as far as the thymus gland for the t cells the b cells will mature in the blood you'll see here that in the, the marrow and such and we have here the organs of the lymphatic system so those uh, lymph nodes and different other structures present within the lymphatic system will help to fight off infection. And the B and the T lymphocytes are a part of that specific immune response. So here's something that a lot of people think about and have opinions on, vaccination. Okay. Vaccination. So uh, I'm sure that many of you here have been vaccinated. There might be one person or two that maybe have not been, right? Or had limited vaccinations and such. We don't know. And that's everybody's, you know, that's their, 
own situation as far as how what they're going to do with their lives. You'll see here that vaccination stimulates immune immunity. And the next couple of images that I'm going to show you are going to help you to understand a little bit regarding what goes on as far as vaccination is concerned. So you'll see here that the vaccine itself contains an antigen. This protein, this antigen, would normally make you sick. But the vaccine should have a very uh, um, suppressed response. So instead of you having that come into your body, like say like the, the chicken pox, right? You're exposed to that, you get sick. Well, how about if we give you a very lower dose of it, it's been suppressed so that it's not really gonna make you, uh, get you sick, right? Shouldn't, but help to, help to really um, allow for your immune system to be exposed to it and mount a specific response to it, which would then prevent you from getting sick. That's the case regarding vaccines. The first injection gives you that active immune response. Later booster shots will help it to be more effective and to give you more of a, a memory of the encounter with whatever's supposed to make you sick, providing that long lasting immune response. Right? So you'll see here that I, what I mentioned to you before was that extremely weakened pathogens, right? So they shouldn't get you sick. Or we can actually uh, give, you'll see there, where it says from killed pathogens that would be injected, okay? Here, this slide will then give you an idea as far as the different types of active and passive immune responses. So look to your right first. When you think of active, you think if there's there's like an active role, like there's something going on that, that really um, requires some type of specific intervention. Passive immune response is something that you're just receiving. You're not doing anything other than just receiving it. So in the case of natural immunity and passive from the breast milk from mom, and actually from the whole birthing process, when, when mom is, when the baby is before the baby is born, mom is helping to contribute to the baby's immune response. You'll see here as far as the artificial passive immune response, where your body is not producing anything, it's just receiving, would be the case of like a transfusion. So how about if someone was uh, bit by a snake, a poisonous snake, right? And then they had to receive the antidote for that venom. Well, that would be considered an artificial passive immune response. Because did the person who was bitten, did they produce anything to fight that venom? No. So what happened was that that artificially, given that anti-venom, it's a blood product, right? This will help to fight the situation there so the patient doesn't actually get paralysis and die. Now, in the case of active immune response, so let's look at where natural, natural is just that your body, you're exposed to the chicken pox virus and you end up what? You end up having an immune response. That's natural immunity. And it's active because your body is actively fighting what goes on as far as being exposed to that chicken pox virus. How about in the case of active artificial? Active artificial is that example that we just talked about, the vaccination. Your body is going to respond to what it's been injected with and mount um, an immune response that will help give you a specific immune response to chickenpox. That's just an example. Now, next slide here. As far as allergies are concerned, I would imagine if we were to look in the room here and ask for a raise of hands, many would say, hey, I've got some kind of allergy. And dust allergies, those are common, right? Um, so harmful substances provoke an immune attack. And so can this immune response be fatal? Yes. So some people really have quite a very severe allergen, allergy to peanuts, to nuts. How about um, to uh, bee stings, right? Those are just an example of two in particular that can be devastating to a patient, to a person who is very allergic, very sensitive to those substances. So pollen, foods, drugs, dust mites, insect venom, cosmetic ingredients, right? These are can be common allergens that can stimulate an immune response and can make a person very, very sick. 
So first time exposed to an allergen, the body generates these antibodies, these specific antibodies. The next exposure, histamine is released. And again, this is where we have those different responses where you know you can have watery eyes, you can runny nose and, and start sneezing and maybe have hives and different skin reactions and such. And how about you can even have more severe situations where can there be inflammation of your respiratory tract? Can this affect your breathing? This is when it's very bad, folks. And this is where we have this anaphylactic shock that can take place, and this can kill you. So this is why people will, will have an EpiPen if they're severely allergic to, say, bee stings and such, right? Or peanuts and such. Just two examples. And this slide here, again, it's just reiterating as far as that anaphylactic so shock. So uh, skin allergic reactions, um, you can have common food allergies like shellfish, eggs, wheat, right? People that are that have issues with gluten, right? Um, anaphylactic shock, this is a severe whole body reaction. It's whole body response. And this can be, again, fatal if not uh, dealt with and treated. We mentioned before, as far as the autoimmune, where your body is actually attacking its own self, right? So you'll see here that the body will generate these antibodies, right? That will then attack your own body cells. And this could be devastating. So rheumatoid arthritis, type one diabetes, again, examples of multiple sclerosis, MS. This is also an example of autoimmune disorders. I mentioned to you regarding HIV and these helper T cells end up becoming infected, end up becoming hijacked, and they prevent the specific immune response from taking place. So this is devastating to, to a person's um, immune system and can really play havoc with their body and lead to death. Because what will happen is that folks that have an immune system that is suppressed will then in turn not be able to fight more simpler uh, infections that you or I that are healthy and well can fight and not be a problem. But those that have HIV and those that have full-blown AIDS, their immune systems are not functioning like they properly should. They can get infected with something that normally you or I could fight and they can die from that infection. So you'll see here uh, antibodies. These antibodies will attach themselves to different types of uh, cells that have been infected or specific cells that are infecting you coming into your body um, or infected body cells, right? Like a virus infected body cell. And they will work to help to mark those cells for destruction by your immune system. So antibodies don't in particularly destroy something, but they work to mark them for destruction by other cells in your immune system. And there are specific antibodies for specific types of infections and such. Now the last two cells, last two slides I put here because of COVID and such. And so hearing the terms epidemic and pandemic. So you'll see here an epidemic. Disease rate increases to a level above what, uh, what would experience would, would predict. A pandemic, breaks out in different places around the world at the same time. And so did we experience a pandemic? We did, right? Look over here as far as then this next slide. And it just gives you a little bit more information regarding pandemic global. As far as epidemic can be more regional and such. So look at this bottom area here. And you can look at this on your own. I've blown it up in a bigger space for you all. But you see here, there are many devastating examples of pandemics that took millions of lives. But one of the worst is HIV. Since 1982, it has already killed about 40 million people. One other uh, heartbreaking example is uh, the cholera pandemic that lasted from 1816 up until 1824, affecting people from all over Asia and Europe and taking over 40 million lives in just eight years. That's a heck of an amount of people that have passed away, right? So these epidemics and pandemics can be devastating to the world. All right, folks, so we're going to stop recording for the lecture today.